Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to this week's Machine Learning Coffee Seminar. Uh, uh, this week, we have a presentation by Balthazar Donon from, from France, and it's about deep statistical solvers. So, and if you have any questions during this talk, just please go ahead and write them in the chat, and then I will direct them to the, to the speaker. So, Balthazar, please go ahead. Okay, so nice to meet you all. My name is Balthazar Donon uh, from Paris. Uh, can you all see my slides? Is that okay? Okay, perfect. So before I start, just a, a few words about me and what I'm interested in. Um, so I went to the Ecole Polytechnique at, uh, in 2013, uh, where I specialized in uh, applied mathematics, physics. It's a very general uh, uh, kind of university, Ecole d'Ingénieur. Uh, but I further specialized in renewable energies and in, gener in uh, energy in general. Uh, and then I went to Stanford University, where I further specialized in, uh, in renewable energies. So it was a, a master's of, of science in um, atmosphere energy. Uh, and then I started to get interested in, um, in machine learning and uh, deep learning and all of that because at Stanford University you can take basically whatever uh, classes you like. So I started to make connections between what I was seeing in my energy classes and what I was seeing in my uh, computer science and statistics classes. Uh, so right now I am a third year PhD student at RTE and LRI. So it's what we call in, in French, uh, intensive. So it's basically an industrial PhD. Um, so I'm doing that at RTE, which is the, um, the French TSO. So the French tr transmission uh, system operator. So we are the people uh, who manage the big uh, electricity transport uh, line, transportation lines. And it's a PhD that I'm also doing at uh, the LRI. So, Laboratoire de Recherche en Informatique in Saclay, in Paris, near Paris. Uh, and the goal of my PhD is to develop novel methods uh, based on graph neural networks to optimize and control complex systems, such as power systems. So, we are really targeted uh, at a, a certain application, which is power systems, but we are still open to many other complex systems. Um, so, I am supervised by uh, Mark Schoenauer from the LRI, Isabelle Guillon from the LRI and uh, Rémi Clément from RTE. So first of all, um, just a few words about um, really the, the philosophy behind uh, what I'm doing. Um, we are working on a quite specific problem, which is power systems. Um, and we are trying to not consider it as just a, a domain of application of, for other techniques. So we really want to avoid using black box tools uh, that were designed for other problems. We want to really understand our data and basically in, in its invariance. So really its uh, core structure. Uh, we also want to get rid to, of the unnecessary components such as uh, the time components of the power systems problem. Uh, we want to simplify things at first you, to, to be able to develop tools for these simple problems and then we we'll, in a few words hopefully uh, in a few years we will be able to go further and also properly uh, define the problem um, so just a few words about the the context uh, as you may all know we have been investing a lot of uh, of money in renewable energies uh, which is great on so many aspects, but it creates uh, some new constraints on the power systems uh, because those new renewable energies are uh, intermittent and quite hard to predict um, because uh, they are really uh, dependent on the weather and uh, it's really hard to predict how many clouds uh, there will be uh, above your solar panels at each time. So really, it creates a new source of uh, uncertainty for the people that are managing the power systems. Also, there are some new consumers' behavior, such as people that are uh, charging their electric cars at night, at some random hour of the night. And also, there are some uh, new, uh, new laws that enforce uh, an open market in the energy ecosystem. And all of that creates a need to develop new tools 
uh, that are faster, that are uh, able to handle um, uncertainty far better than what we do right now. So the long-term goal is really to control the power system in real time with the uncertainty and with all the complexity of the problem. But for now, we will focus on an intermediate problem, which is trying to predict the flows through a power system, knowing the injections and the uh, admittance matrix. Um, but first of all, let's try to focus on the data and then I will say a few words about the, the problem that we are trying to solve. So the data that we have are basically big graphs. Uh, a, power systems, a power system is basically just a big graph where you have uh, pieces of information that are defined at every node and pieces of information that are defined at every edges. Um, since there was no word for this kind of uh, complex graph, uh, we decided to call that interaction graphs, but if you know about the exact word that, uh, that the literature uses for that, uh, let me know. Um, so the data that we are considering is quite specific because it's very different from what is uh, usually encountered in statistical learning. So if you take, uh, as an instance, pictures, um, so here you have the, a picture of a beautiful cat. Um, there is no fundamental law that tells you there is a cat in this picture. There is no equation, there is no closed form equation to tell you, okay, there is a cat here. Um, so basically it requires a very high level of, abstra of abstraction to be able to construct a representation of what's happening in this picture and then devise, okay, there is a cat or no, there is not a cat. Um, in power systems, it's very different because we have uh, a fundamental law, which is uh, what we call Kirchhoff's law. So basically, it's just a law that makes sure that everything that goes in uh, also goes out. There is no accumulation of energy nowhere in the grid, and there is no uh, spontaneous cre creation of energy. Um, so it's really as simple as that. It's just uh, energy conservation. Um, and also we have an explicit mathematical uh, formalism that is able to describe everything that happens on this system. So it's really a, a different perspective that we are uh, using. Um, so let's define the data. Um, so our interaction graph G uh, is defined by N, A and B, where N is an integer, it's basically the amount of nodes. So here on the right part, you can see that we have four nodes, okay. In B, we will store uh, all the information about, um, all the information that is uh, located at nodes. So in our power systems problem, it's basically the amount of power that is being produced, that is being consumed, and uh, there are some other physical components, but I won't give any more details about that. Uh, so basically we have, um, a vector in uh, five dimensions that is defined at every node. Okay. And then we have this uh, weird object, which is a little bit more than just an uh, adjacency matrix, because for every edge you have a vector. So here it's a two dimensional vector. Um, so yeah, you have uh, basically an edge that is defined uh, in two dimensions. Okay. So this is the input. Oh yeah, and the, the physical interpretation of uh, these edges is that you store uh, all the physical characteristics of your power line. So for instance, the resistance, the admittance, and you can store uh, you know, a, a lot of physical uh, um, components, characteristics. And as an output, we want to predict uh, a certain state that is defined at every node. Okay, so it's really a piece of information in two dimensions that is not the same at every node, indeed. And, uh, and that's all. And the physical interpretation here is that uh, we want to predict the voltage magnitude and phase angle uh, everywhere on the grid. So it's, really, it's actually a problem that is really important for us because once you have those uh, phase angle and uh, magnitudes, you can uh, compute the actual flows that are going through every line 
and you can make sure that all those flows are below a certain, uh, a certain threshold so that you do not harm the system. Because once the currents go uh, too high, uh, it completely breaks your power system. Okay. And also, uh, this system is quite interesting because it's a graph. And as maybe some of you already know, uh, you can perform some, some permutations over your graph and it won't actually alter the structure of your graph. So if you perform a permutation sigma uh, over your graph that is on the left side, it's, you are basically performing a node reordering. So you are changing the names. So you can see that here, one becomes four, uh, two becomes one, etc., etc. So it's very basic permutation. If you have any question, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, and also, if we try to apply this um, this very same permutation to the output u, uh, it's it's basically the same. It's uh, node reordering, so you can see that one becomes four, etc. Okay, so this may seem very basic and trivial. Uh, but it's actually quite important for us uh, because what we do when we try to find the actual state of the system, so the voltage magnitude and, uh, and magnitude, uh, voltage magnitude and uh, phase angle, sorry, uh, is that we are trying to minimize a loss function L, which is basically the violation of physical laws. And this function is permutation invariant. So this means that, so this function L takes as an input a couple uh, UG. So U being the state and G being the interaction graph. So basically U is the output of your problem and G is the input. And this function L outputs a, a real, real value. And your goal is to minimize this function L. And you also know that it's a permutation invariant function, meaning that uh, if you perform a permutation over uh, the inputs, so over both uh, u and g, then it does not affect your loss function, your cost function. Um, so here in our case uh, for power systems, uh, it's really simple to understand because um, the violation of physical laws uh, will not be affected if you reorder all the nodes. If you consider that this city shall be named uh, I don't know, Paris and this other should be named Toulouse and you switch cities or whatever you want, it won't change the physical reality of what's happening on your grid. So this function is actually permutation invariant. Um, and then I'll say a few words later about uh, equivalence. Okay, um, but now let's try to, to, to understand the kind of problem that we are trying to solve. So the initial problem that we want to solve is the following. So let's consider G uh, an interaction graph, so basically a, a power grid, and L a certain cost function. So in our case, the variation of physical laws. Our goal is to find the state U star of G, which is the state that minimizes the variation of physical laws. Okay, so we consider that we are, cons that we are interested in only one G, and we want the optimal U. And basically what we are doing, uh, what we are currently doing at, at RT when we try to solve this problem is that we use uh, uh, classical optimization tools such as Newton Raphson. It works quite fine, al although it's a bit slow, but basically we are making no assumption about um, the distribution of your interaction graphs. We are making no assumption about the orders of magnitude of your um, power of your power production consumption etc there is no probabilistic assumption but what we want to do here is uh, use tools from the statistical learning domain so we have to introduce some sort of probability at some point so that we have you know uh, minimization of an expectation instead of just this expression so now we will consider uh, the following so we have an interaction graph G that is now drawn from a distribution D. Okay, and we are looking for a parameterized mapping F theta uh, that maps G, so the, the power grid, to its actual physical state. Okay. 
And the statistical solver problem is the following. So given a distribution D uh, on the space of interaction graphs G and a certain state, uh, space state, state uh, uh, yeah, and the loss function L, uh, we want to solve uh, the following problem. So basically, we want to find uh, the, par the parameterized mapping F theta that will be the best on average over our distribution. So maybe if you have some questions about uh, this equation. Because uh, when, when I present this equation, sometimes people uh, struggle uh, to understand, but I'm pretty sure all of you are experts. Okay, so no questions, great. Uh, okay, so basically our goal is, uh, now that we have defined the problem that we are interested in, uh, our goal is really to find a, a certain F theta that will be able to perform what we are doing. And F theta will be our solver, will be our, uh, our, uh, yeah, our mapping between uh, the inputs of the problem and the output. Okay, so um, we are interested in using uh, neural networks because it's uh, quite a fancy, uh, um, you know, the, the thing that everything should do. Um, but also we are really interested in, um, in the computational speed of uh, neural networks. Um, and yeah, so anyway, I, I will uh, show you some interesting properties. Um, but what kind of neural networks are we interested in? Because if we did the things uh, in the most straightforward way, we would use a very basic neural network, which takes everything as an input. Okay, you basically put everything as a simple vector. Uh, so you, you flatten your input, then you put it into, inside your fully connected neural network, and then you have your, your prediction. But actually things are a little bit more complicated than that. So if, you, if we were to use uh, a fully connected neural network, actually the problem is that you, it only works on vectors, on vector inputs. So we would have to modify our input, which basically looks like that. So you have here, you have uh, A on the left and you have B on the right. So you can see that you have a 3D tensor uh, and a, a matrix. So first of all, we have to flatten all of that so that we can fit it into a, a neural network. Okay, so whatever, let, let's do that. And then we will uh, train our fully connected neural network on uh, a certain amount of data, D, on a certain uh, empirical distribution. So D can be, for instance, all the database of uh, everything that happened on the power grids uh, for the past 10 years, uh, let's say. Um, and let's say also that in your database, you always have this uh, power grid configuration. Okay, and actually uh, your neural network will get extremely good at predicting the power flows, at, at predicting the voltage phase angle and the magnitude everywhere on the grid, as long as you are in this situation. Okay, but what happens if you perform a permutation over your inputs? So you can see that what is on, on the bottom of the slide is actually exactly the same as what is on top. The only change is that we perform the permutation, but it shouldn't alter the, the system. You know, the physics is basically the same, so it shouldn't change anything, uh, just a, a permutation. But what we observe is that uh, we obtain very good predictions, uh, indeed for G when there is no permutation because it was trained on this kind of situation, so it already knows how, how to predict uh, the voltage phase angle and the magnitude. But here on, on the bottom of the slide, uh, it will be extremely bad because it will, uh, be, it will have to perform inference uh, of our case that it has never encountered uh, in the past. So um, whenever I, I present this slide, uh, there is always one or two people that say, okay, but why not uh, try to do some data augmentation uh, and increase our dat data sets by, uh, you know, performing some uh, random permutation over our inputs. Um, that's, that would be an interesting thing to do if we were 
uh, only working with very small power grids. But in our case, uh, we are dealing with power grids that are made of uh, something like 7,000 nodes. So extremely large systems and the amount of permutation is uh, N factorial. Uh, so it's really something that is intractable that you cannot uh, do. So what we observed here is that fully connected neural networks are not permutation equivalent. And actually there is another uh, perturbation that you can apply to your system that is uh, quite dangerous for us is that uh, when you try to delete a node or when you try to add a node, uh, this can happen. And this happens uh, every day uh, on the French power grid because we are all the time uh, opening lines and reconfiguring the way uh, uh, power lines are interconnected. So this is not just, a, a, you know, uh, something that could happen in, in the next 10 days. It's something that happens every day. In our database, we do not have um, always the same amount of nodes. We, the topology is always changing. So it's really something important for us. It's not just uh, for the sake of doing something fancy. Uh, so fully connected are uh, not permutation equivalents. Uh, but what about graph neural networks? So I'm pretty sure most of you already know quite a lot about graph neural networks. Uh, can you confirm that? Not that much? Okay, okay, great. So the following slides won't be useless. Um, so graph neural networks. So basically graph neural networks is an iterative process that relies on local message passing. Uh, so it's really a, a, an algorithm that uh, propagates information between direct neighbors over a graph structure. So, and you will see that there is no need to flatten, to flatten data. Um, and also the formulation that I will show is what I'm using in my research. Um, but basically there are as many uh, formulas as there are uh, researchers working on graph neural networks. So don't be shocked if you are used to something uh, quite different. Uh, the key idea of graph neural networks is to um, create a latent representation of all your nodes. So we can see that on the left part of the slide, you have your input, okay? Uh, you have uh, the, the information that is defined at every node that is in blue here, that we called B at the beginning. And we have in red, we have A, so all the edge information. And then we will create some sort of uh, latent representation of each of our nodes. So here we create uh, latent representation H. Okay. Um, so as I said, it's an iterative process, but at the very first iteration of your process, you do not have any information about uh, the graph, basically. Uh, so each node has no clue of what's happening um, on the rest of the graph. So we chose to initialize the states of uh, each node to zero. Uh, this could be done uh, any other way, I, I think. Maybe if you add some noise uh, here, it's, it, could, uh, it could be interesting. But anyway, all the experiments that we conducted, we initialized by zero. Uh, and then you perform some message passing operation. So here in this formula, you can see that the latent representation of node i at uh, iteration k plus one is equal to the latent representation of node i at iteration k. So you keep the same message, it's kind of a ResNet uh, architecture, um, plus a certain correction term uh, that will incorporate information from uh, the, uh, the local inputs at uh, node i, okay? And also, um, so, sorry, and also some uh, information about your direct neighbors uh, and the information about the edge between you and your direct neighbors. Okay. Um, okay, and once you have performed this uh, propagation step enough times, then you decode your information by using a, a small decoder here that we call C. 
uh, where you basically take uh, as an input the latent representation of every node and you convert it into an actual prediction. So while H has no physical meaning, uh, U has a physical meaning. It has physical units and that's what we will actually use uh, to try to compute the, the loss. Uh, what I didn't say here is that uh, all your small functions, um, so psi and phi, are actually neural networks. So those will be learned jointly during the, the training process. Okay, so to sum up the, the idea of, um, of this uh, graph neural network, uh, at first we initialize the information of every node to zero. Then we perform some message passing uh, steps uh, where basically we, we correct the, the, the latent representation of every node by incorporating information about uh, the local input at the, the given node. And we also incorporate information about the direct neighbors. Uh, and then once we have done that uh, enough times, we decode. Uh, we decode the message to get an actual prediction. Um, so it's really important uh, to understand that this algorithm, this uh, neural network architecture, is actually permutation equivariant. So permutation uh, equivariant is a little bit different from permutation invariant. So let me go back a few slides uh, before. So here. Okay. So as I said, the, the loss function that we're interested in is permutation invariant. Okay, so if you perform a permutation over the inputs, it won't change anything. Okay, but as you can see on the bottom of the slide, um, here our um, graph neural network, so our function f, is a mapping between g and u, so between power systems and their actual states. And if we perform a permutation over the inputs, it results in a permutation over the outputs. So that's what we call permutation equivalence, basically. And it's really important because uh, if, you, if we simply forget about uh, all these uh, neural networks and everything, is if we were just interested in uh, solving the problem that I just uh, shown you, showed you, um, by using classical optimization, so we would uh, use, uh, for instance, uh, neutron raphson method. Uh, the neutron raphson method that tries to minimize the violation of physical law is actually permutation equivariant. If you perform a permutation over the inputs of your uh, neutron raphson method, then you will, it will result in a permutation over the outputs. Um, okay, if you have any, any questions. Once again, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so graph neural networks are permutation equivariant. And actually, um, so what can I say? Um, so a way to understand that is that um, basically we are only doing local operations. We are always um, propagating information between direct neighbors. There is no global uh, information. There is no, uh, we, we are basically just transferring information between direct neighbors. And also it's very important to notice that uh, here in the message passing step, we are taking the sum over the direct neighbors. So it's important to take the sum or the mean or something like that, because you do not know uh, how many neighbors each node will have. So some nodes uh, will have one neighbors, some other nodes will have 10 neighbors, uh, but your small uh, neural network uh, psi, uh, it's a fully connected neural network. So it has to take as an input always the same size. So by taking the, the sum of uh, the neighbors, you are uh, basically keeping this uh, input size uh, constant. Okay, so that's great. And I see that there is no question, so let's be there clear. Um, so then I will proceed to, to go a, a bit further and to detail uh, the distinction between uh, what we call the proxy approach and what we call the deep statistical solver approach. 
So in the proxy approach, which is basically the most uh, straightforward approach, um, you try to imitate a classical optimization solver. So basically you have your interaction graph G as an input here, and you input it uh, into uh, an actual solver that comes from classical optimization. So that could be uh, newton raphson that could be a LU method if you are interested in solving uh, linear systems. And then you will, so it gives you a, a U star, which you consider to be the ground truth, okay? And you will also input your uh, interaction graph into your function F theta, okay? And that will produce a, a prediction, basically. And during the training process, you will try to minimize the distance between your prediction and the actual solution that is provided by the classical optimization method, okay? So uh, this is uh, kind of... Excuse yeah. me, we have a question from Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan yeah. asks, do you see a difference in learning between low degree and high degree nodes? That's a, a very good question. Um, that's something that I haven't dived in uh, for now. Uh, I'm not sure that there are uh, researchers interested in, in this kind of aspects. Um, so basically we hope um, that all the nodes uh, typically have the same around the same amount of uh, of neighbors um, but indeed you you could imagine that uh, you could create a data set with uh, you know some really strange uh, network where you have one central node and that would be connected to every other um, so i i have no intuition about that and it's uh, really Really interesting question. If you have any intuition uh, about that, uh, I would be happy to, to hear about that. Um, so yeah, sorry for not being able to answer. Um, okay, so I just detailed the, the proxy approach. So you try to learn an approximation of a classical solver, uh, of a classical solver. But here, in what we proposed, uh, what we call the statistical solver approach, we input our interaction graph G into our function F theta, so our graph neural network F theta. And it creates uh, a certain predi prediction uh, U hat. But basically, we know that the classical solver uh, method is trying to minimize a certain loss function L. So in our case, uh, the function L is the violation of physical laws. But we do not need to, to call uh, this neutron Raphson method because we already know which function it's trying to minimize. So why not use this function L directly as a training loss? So that's what we are doing here. We are basically directly trying to minimize the violation of physical laws during the training process. We are no longer trying to take inspiration from uh, another method. We are, it's really, we are learning uh, directly uh, an optimization algorithm, F theta, uh, which is more of a, a boosted heuristics. You know, it's not a, a nice uh, optimization uh, algorithm uh, that relies on a, a deep understanding of linear algebra. Um, it's more of a heuristics that will be able to quickly um, figure out, okay, what is happening on the grid and uh, what should I predict at every node. Uh, so there is no need to call uh, an expensive uh, uh, classical optimization method. Uh, it works with problems uh, for which there are some convergence issues. So here in our case, um, in the power systems, uh, there are some big convergence issues. The newton raphson method usually works, but uh, it happens that sometimes it's really too, too difficult for it to converge, uh, while our method will basically, it, it won't stop it. <laughs> it will always predict something, and if you train it on data for which the newton raphson doesn't converge, uh, you will still manage to get decent predictions. Uh, and also, uh, what I'm doing right now during the last year of my PhD is that I'm trying to uh, deal with uh, multi-level uh, optimization. 
Um, so basically, I'm considering a problem where we are um, interested in solving a certain problem subject to uh, another loss function is minimized. So basically, we have two loss, two loss functions and we have two neural networks that each try to minimize a different loss function. So we have this kind of a stacked architecture. Um, but I, I do not have any slides about it. It's really a current work for now. Um, so if it's not too late, I can show you some experiments. Is that okay? Okay, great. Um, so here. So first of all, we try to see what happens if we if we try to solve the most simple problem, uh, which is a linear system. Um, so it's a, basically a linear system that that is derived from the Poisson equation. Uh, that is discretized over a certain domain. So all the, the geometries um, are uh, random. So basically, in our data sets, we have a bunch of uh, tensors A and uh, matrix B uh, that change all the time. I mean, I mean um, both A and B vary. We do not have uh, the same amount of nodes in every um, sample. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, randomness, I would say. Uh, and the last function that we are trying to, to minimize is the following. It's basically a linear, systems, uh, a linear system. Uh, and instead of saying uh, that we want AU is equal to B, we uh, formulated it as uh, trying to minimize uh, the norm of uh, AU minus B. Uh, okay, so here, um, so our deep statistical solver approach managed to get a really good correlation with the LU method, which is basically the state of the art for uh, these linear systems, uh, which is great, uh, although it's indeed uh, not absolutely perfect. And for, for the sake of, uh, you know, ju just to make sure, we also try to, to see what happens if we use the proxy approach. Uh, meaning that the proxy approach uh, is uh, trying to imitate the output of the LU method. Uh, so indeed, we got better results with the proxy approach, but still we, we have to keep in mind that the DSS method um, is completely unsupervised. Uh, it was not fed any uh, information about the output of the LU. It's not trying to imitate uh, the LU method. It's a really completely independent uh, method. Okay, so that was for the, the simple linear system. But we are in, uh, indeed interested in much more complex systems, uh, such as power systems, uh, where we have a set of equations that are uh, highly nonlinear, as you can see by uh, the presence of cosines and sines here. And we basically try to, to predict uh, the voltage magnitude and phase angle uh, everywhere on the grid on two different data sets. Uh, so we have a first data set that is uh, uh, made of quite small uh, power systems. Uh, so we have here the, so it's, a, it's a very common in the power systems literature to use uh, uh, those uh, test cases. So here we have a small power system that is um, made of 14 nodes. And in both the train sets and the test sets, we also disconnect, randomly disconnected some lines to have some uh, randomness also in terms of A. And we uh, randomly sampled all the power uh, production and power consumption. So you have uh, a lot of randomness in terms of B, in terms of uh, node uh, information. Okay, and we basically did the same for the uh, for the case 118 nodes, uh, which is a, a simplification of the Californian power grid. Um, okay, and here you can see that uh, in terms of V and theta, it's really interesting because uh, we got extremely good results uh, for the proxy method. So if you take a look at V and theta uh, for the proxy, you can see that we are above 99.99% uh, correlation with the newton raphson method, which is great. Uh, but in the end, what we are really interested in is the 
PIJ and QIJ, which are, which are the, uh, the power flows, the actual flows through every uh, power line. Okay, and for the deep statistical solver approach, uh, which is once again uh, a completely independent method from the Newton Raphson solver, it's really not, we are not trying to imitate the Newton Raphson solver, it's completely unsupervised. We observe that we got slightly, um, slightly worse results in terms of V and theta, so phase uh, angle and magnitude, but in terms of actual power flows that are computed through the, the power grid, uh, we got extremely good results. Uh, and in terms of uh, inference time, uh, we got uh, very good results also. So we managed to decrease the amount of, uh, of time uh, um, needed by two to three orders of magnitude, uh, which is uh, great. Okay, so I think that concludes my presentation. So do you have any questions? Okay, so thanks, Paul. Sir. Really interesting talk. So Jonathan has a, has a sort of follow-up mm -hmm. comment. Jonathan, okay. would you like to uh, talk directly? Oh, hey. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just put a comment. I do, I do not have intuition, sorry, about what would <laughs> oh, happy, okay. but happen. But I, I've read around graph neural networks for collaborative filtering. And in that case, the difficult thing is that some users have very few mm. um, reaction, uh, interactions with the items. Mm. And when you represent that as a graph, that means that graph has a low degree, basically. And, and this can be problematic. So uh, there's some work where they, they use something called jumping knowledge, which they basically start to incorporate the neighbors of neighbors and then mm. the neighbors of the neighbors, neighbors and, and so on. And they use pruning methods to choose the, the paths which are most informative. So this is a way to handle it. So I, I, I think that those low degree nodes will not uh, be represented well. Mm -hmm. And they would require some tricks like this jumping knowledge to, yeah, uh, yeah. that's my intuition, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, and actually that's something that I've uh, thought quite a lot. Uh, because right now I'm trying to work with uh, actual data from the real power systems, uh, which is ex which is huge and takes a lot of time to train uh, an actual uh, rough neural network to work on them. Um, but basically, I try to 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 think of a way to accelerate this training by allowing information to to basically flow faster through the graph. Um, but the problem is that we are really uh, stuck with this, um, with the, the graph structure, because we want to predict uh, a certain information for every node over, over the graph. If we were interested in, um, you know, in predicting some sort of uh, class for the graph or some sort of global predictor for, for the, the graph, um, then I think it would be really interested to use this kind of techniques. Uh, but here we are really, um, the inputs, I mean, the, the, the output is basically the same, has the same size and the same uh, structure of the output. So we cannot really perform some sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, change in scale uh, through the neural network architecture. Um, or maybe we can, but I do not see any way of doing it properly for now. Maybe, I'm not sure how relevant this is to your work, but there's uh, fast methods for, one, one is called fast GCN, so fast mm -hmm. graph collaborative networking. I think it's something like this. And the, the other one, they do some web scale graph okay. neural network. Yeah, but again, those tricks might not be good for you, as you said. So mm. if they lose too much information, then yeah, it might yeah, not be Yeah, I will take a look. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then, then we have a question in, in chat from Eric, and he asked, wouldn't it make sense to use a quick but approximate neural network solution as the initial vector for the classical iterative solver? 
which would then converts quickly from this better initialization. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, I think, um, you know, when you are working with such uh, critical industrial systems, um, people are not really willing to use uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and even more at uh, the company uh, in which I'm, I'm working, there are very few people that are doing artificial intelligence and it's not always, um, you know, well understood by others. And so, yeah, basically, if we were to, to apply uh, artificial intelligence in the situation that uh, I just showed you, uh, I think it would be as, at first, as an initialization of a more rigorous um, classical optimization method, indeed. Uh, and actually, it has been uh, performed. So I have been, uh, this summer, I've been in contact with uh, um, uh, an intern from a, a French startup that works on uh, data uh, that comes from the gas distribution. Uh, so actually, it's quite different from the power systems. But uh, you have different equations, but you have basically the same problem, the same mathematical problem. Uh, and they did what you proposed. Um, so they try to initialize uh, their newton raphson method by using what I just uh, showed you, and they show that it works uh, really fine. And in the end, you can really trust uh, your results because uh, uh, those newton raphson method, you, you can have some guarantees over the, the, the fact that you are close enough to the actual uh, optimum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it seems that we are, we are running out of time, but, but if you have time, then there still seems to be one more question from, from Luigi. Is this okay. okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so Luigi, would you like to ask this yourself? Or should I yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, great talk, of course. And um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, uh, so I see that one of the, I mean, one of the hyperparameters of the network is uh, the number of uh, iterate, maximum number of iterations, yep. uh, bar k. And I, I imagine you select it by some form of hyperparameter optimization. And... Um, but I was thinking, so what if different, so that would be the same for all inputs, but what if uh, different inputs would require some uh, different uh, optimal uh, number of iterations? Mm. Because it looks like you're only picking up the last, uh, say the last output from the last iteration, but say, have you tried doing something different? Does it make any sense? Um, okay, that's a, a very interesting question. And actually we have a, a theorem about that. So I didn't show it in the presentation because I think it's uh, quite heavy and hard to understand. But basically what we showed is that um, the maximum uh, amount of iterations that you need to perform uh, is actually related to the maximum um, diameter uh, of the graphs that are uh, in, your, uh, in the support of your distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so basically you should consider the worst case, so the biggest mm -hmm. graph and the, most, uh, the one with uh, the highest diameter. Uh, is everyone... Uh, familiar with the diameter of a graph. So maybe I should say a few words about that. It's basically the, the maximum distance, the maximum geodesic distance between uh, any two points of a graph. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in the end, it's really related to, uh, to the worst diameter of your data set. Um, so that's, that's basically what we did in the experiments instead of, uh, we in, indeed uh, try to, to see what happens if we try to increase uh, the amount of propagations and try to decrease it. But we basically uh, stuck with, um, with the idea that we, we use the, the diameter of the worst graph. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Yeah, this means though, let's say for some, for some network, say for, you know, so you can see the worst case scenario, but what I'm saying is, uh, it looks like maybe for the average case, you could mm. maybe r run less iterations, so it's yeah. going to be more dynamical. I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering. Um, and actually, th that's a, a good question because um, here in, in the neural network architecture that I just uh, showed you, we are using different neural networks at every uh, propagation. Yeah. Uh, so indeed, you have to choose the amount of propagation that you are doing before you train your neural network and you are stuck with the uh, with, with this. Uh, but if instead of that, you use some sort of a recurrent neural network, 
So that would be a recurrent uh, ResNet graph neural network, yeah. uh, basically. Then you are free to choose the amount of uh, propagations that you use. Yeah, I mean, the, the alternative would be, say, uh, neural ODs. You could say yeah. that those also have, you know, such a yeah, flexible yeah, yeah. number of... Yeah. That's definitely a, a direction I want to, to dive uh, into. Okay. Um, Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, really interesting discussion. I, I think we are now, now over time and, and we should now close this session. So if, if anyone wants to still discuss, I, I guess we could still still remain here. But but thanks for everyone for, for your attention. Also thanks thanks to the speaker for a really interesting talk. And and we will see you next next week for, for another talk. Okay, have a nice day. Thank you, Balthasar. It was really interesting. <laughs> and then good luck with your PhD. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.